Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this time of worship and celebration. We've gathered together from around the region. We gather here with Jesus, he's in our midst. He's the focus of what we do here. So let's pray. Jesus, we have gathered here to worship you. We've already been worshiping you all this week long. As we seek to follow you, as we strive to serve you, love and serve those around us in your name. And now we, we dedicate this time to you, Lord. We worship you with our singing, with our prayers, as we read the Bible and meditate upon it. Lord, of the, all that we are, may we worship you and give you glory. Amen. I hope you had time before the service to, uh, to sing the song, In Christ There Is No East or West. I chose that song because of the events that have happened in the last few weeks, the racism that we see in the world and, and even in our midst in Canada. There's one line in that song that's the, verse, the third verse. Join hands then, people of the faith, whatever your race may be, all children of the living God are surely kin to me. To think that people of other races are part of my family. But that's what the Bible tells us. That's what God tells us. And that's what, that's what we're here today for. We're going to take some time for prayer. And uh, I've heard the, the prayer requests that people have made. And, and so let's take those and bring those, bring ourselves to God in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, prayer is a time of celebration and joy as we share life with you. But prayer can also be a time of grief and mourning. As we think about lost people who have died, there's been a number of people like that this past week. We think of Taylor Jeff, who developed leukemia suddenly and now, just a few weeks later, has died. We pray for the Jeff family and the Care family. Hold them close to you, God. We pray about Pete Reed, who also died, had a stroke at the age of 64. And we pray for his family. Hold them close, Lord. Let them know of your love. Similarly, we pray for the family of Francis Merrick. <clears throat> and in all these people, Lord, the the loved ones, the family, the friends, that they can't gather together because of COVID-19 virus. They have to talk on the phone or over a screen, but they can't share in person their grief and mourning. And that just multiplies the grief. So, Lord, be a comfort to them. Hold them close. Last week, we prayed about Arlene's Aunt Jerry with the hip surgery. <clears throat> Forty years ago, that would have been a death sentence, but now they just put someone back together, put some metal plates in, and away you go. No, it's not quite that easy, especially for someone who's in their 90s, but she's recovering and she's doing well, and we thank you, Lord. We also pray about Arlene's friend, Cheryl Lewis, who has breast cancer. And I know as soon as I said that word, all the women here go, oh. So, Lord, I, we pray for, for Cheryl. I ask God that you would give her strength. That strength that comes when we trust you, so we don't need to worry or be afraid, because we're in good hands. We pray for the people on our prayer list. We think about Joan Moorcroft and Monty as well. For Alex, Mom and Dad, Kate and Dave. Pray for Linda Grills and Gerald, for Ellen Jones. Pray for Peter Mittler. Peter is the, the son of Betty Mittler, who is the mother of Jane, my wife. And Betty now is part of our congregation. And we thank the Lord for her, but we pray for Peter, who possibly has and probably has cancer of the pancreas. It's this time of not knowing, of Waiting to hear the news, that's the, perhaps the hardest. Our minds start to imagine all kinds of things. 
And again, God, I pray that you would give him your spirit, a spirit of calm, peace, trusting you. Lord, in our world, there is so much racism. And people, their lives are affected by it. Some lives are destroyed by it. We've seen that in the news lately. We pray for, for those who, who suffer from racism. God, that you would bring justice. You would give comfort and healing. Healing of the body and also the heart and soul. We pray for ourselves, though, as well, that, that when we face racism, when we hear it in our midst, that we would have the wisdom to know what to do and what to say and the courage to do it. Help us to be godly people, following your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you all to join with me now as we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, I hope you all had fun this past week writing those cards of encouragement. I know I did, and I know that they'll bring joy to those who receive them. But today I'm pausing in my series of messages on encouragement so that we can take time to consider what is happening in the world around us. This past Monday in the United States, President Trump said in a speech, I am the president of law and order and an ally of all peaceful protesters. And at the very moment that he was saying that, his officials were giving orders to the police and the National Guard to use tear gas and rubber bullets to get rid of peaceful protesters nearby. That protest had been going on most of the afternoon. There was no apparent reason why they were suddenly attacked. The reason soon became clear. It was so that President Trump could walk over that way, stand in front of a church, holding up a Bible, and have his picture taken. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. I remember two years ago after the G7 summit, when Trump accused Prime Minister Trudeau of being dishonest and weak. I thought it was absolutely hilarious for Trump to call someone else dishonest. But to call someone weak seems to be the ultimate insult for Trump. I think he lives in fear of himself ever being perceived as weak. This past week, White House aides told reporters that the strategy for that photo op on Monday was to demonstrate to the nation that President Trump was in charge. He was in control. He was strong. Well, he certainly did demonstrate something, but it wasn't what he intended. But all this controversy over Trump diverts attention from the main issue, which is racism. George Floyd is only the latest of countless black people who've been imprisoned or murdered by police simply because they're black. And it's not just the police. This has been going on for hundreds of years. People being murdered and beaten. Or just simply discriminated against in jobs, by the government, and so on. The laws may have changed, but the laws don't change people's attitudes. In this past week, Prime Minister Trudeau reminded us that he, we in Canada have our own issues of racism to deal with, whether it's Blacks or Asians or Indigenous people. But here's the thing. We are a white congregation living in a mostly white town in a mostly white county. Now, we don't think of ourselves as racist. I mean, we're not around people of other races, so we, we don't face that. 
And the occasional time when we do interact with someone who is a different color skin, we're polite and civil and we pat ourselves on the back for being inclusive. Let's open the Bible and see what God has to say to us about racism. And the number one scripture that comes to my mind when I think of this is Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 26 to 28. Paul writes, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on the character of Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In the early days of the church, there were some squabbles between people of different ethnic groups. You can read about this in Acts 6, verse 1. The Apostle Paul made it clear that your background didn't matter. Now, although that passage does mention you know, whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, none of that matters. He did mention skin color, but I think it still applies. And the principle here is that through faith in Jesus, we are all children of God. We are all one family, sisters and brothers in Christ. So racism has no place among Christians. I've told before my own experience of this, but that was a number of years ago, so I'm going to tell it again. Forty years ago, I was in the South American country of Bolivia. Now, in Bolivia, only the very rich people have vehicles. For most people, if they want to go to a different town, they either go, they pay for a bus, or most people actually who were poor will get on a truck. <clears throat> Freight is carried between towns in cargo trucks, large trucks, but these trucks have an open top. They're open to the air. And so what happens is that people will give the truck driver a few pesos and then climb up on top of the cargo. One time I shared the back of a truck with about 30 other people for three days. It's a good way to meet people and get to know them. So it happened that one day I was sitting at the side of the road waiting for the next truck to come along. It could be a few minutes, it could be several hours. So I pulled out my pocket New Testament and I was reading it. A young man was walking by and as he walked by, he glanced over at me. He spun around on the spot. He excitedly came over to me and he said to me, Eres tu Romano? Which is Spanish for, are you a brother? Now understand, we're from different countries, different cultures, we have different color skin, we speak different languages. I was barely uh, passable in Spanish. In short, we're total strangers, having almost nothing in common. Yet we were brothers. Because we were both followers of Jesus, we have God as our father, Jesus as our brother, and that makes us brothers. So I'll say it again, racism has no place among Christians. So what is our role then? I believe that our role is to model love and respect for all. Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. It's very simple. As Nelson Mandela says, people absorb whatever their culture teaches them. But Jesus teaches us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's from Matthew 5, 13 and 14. In other words, we teach with our words and we demonstrate with our lives a new culture, a culture of respect and love for all races. Now, that's pretty difficult where we live in an area where there's very few non-white people. But here's what we can do. First, no racial or ethnic jokes. You know, did you hear the one about the Nufi who 
No, <clears throat> whether it's Nufis or Jews or Arabs or blondes, just don't tell those kind of jokes. The only exception is this. You can tell a joke about your own dream. I've heard on the radio some great comedians who tell stories about what it's like growing up in a Pakistani family or whatever their background was. Just <laughs> wonderful stories, funny. And so you can do that too. You tell stories, jokes about your own group. And similarly, if you hear someone else telling a racist joke, you can interrupt and simply say, excuse me, racism isn't a joke. It hurts people. Now you'll probably offend some people doing that, and that's okay. Because God tells us to stand up for what is right, to stand up for justice. And we need to do that. Here's another thing that we can do. Listen and learn. The past few days, the national news has been carrying stories of people from across the country who have experienced racism, not just at the hands of the police, but at, in sports, at work, in the community, with, at, with government, uh, when they go to apply for jobs, when they apply for housing, or for rent, just all kinds of situations. And you might get tired of hearing these stories, but as one person said, imagine how people get tired who are experiencing the racism. In the Bible, in James 1.19, it says, remember this, my dear friends, everyone must be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to become angry. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, listen before you answer. If you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. So put those two Bible verses together and they remind us that it's a virtue to listen and listen well before forming our own opinions. This is especially true in matters where we don't know what we're talking about. You see, we have no understanding, no appreciation, no idea at all what it's like to be black in Canada or indigenous or Asian. I'll tell you a story to show what I mean. About a year ago, I heard on the radio about an evening seminar on gender differences. And the person who was doing the presentation said to the group, this question is just for the men in the room. How many of you sometime during this day, looked around yourself to make sure that you were safe. The men looked at each other in the room, puzzled, not sure if they understood the question correctly. No one put up their hand. And then the presenter said, now this question is just for the women in the room. How many of you sometime during this day looked around yourself to make sure that you were safe? Every single hand went up. If I had been in that room, I would have been one of the confused men. Even when I walk down a dark road late at night, it never occurs to me to be afraid, to be nervous. I have no idea, no experience of the kind of harassment, abuse, and more that women deal with on a regular basis. And in the same way, none of us in St. Paul's Church have any idea of the kind of harassment and abuse, abuse and more that non-white people deal with on a regular basis. The way to learn about racism is to listen to people who have experienced it. Hear their stories. Feel their frustration and anger over the injustice that they live with. I'm going to conclude with a story which demonstrates how powerful it can be when we replace racism with respect. Tony Campolo is a popular Christian speaker, and he tells what happened to him. So I'm just going to read what he wrote. He says, more than a decade ago, I was on a speaking tour in New Zealand. I found that John Perkins, the prominent African Christian leader in community development, had been there a month earlier and had caused quite a stir. 
and was, as he was pleading for respect for the indigenous Maori culture before an important gathering of church leaders, he was confronted by a man who tried to make the claim that there was no way that Christians could respect the Maori culture because it was permeated by demonic influences. The man made the claim that demon worship was so much a part of Maori culture that as Christians, they should destroy it. John Perkins responded brilliantly. Perhaps you may be right. It may be that Maori culture is permeated by demonic influences and needs to be purged. But before we purge the Maori culture of its demonic influences, perhaps we should first try to purge the white man's culture of its demonic influences. His answer was inspired. It reiterated the message that Jesus communicated, communicated so clearly when he called upon people not to look for splinters in the eyes of others until they first got rid of the beams in their own eyes. New Zealand is a small country and its people are very connected. By the time I arrived there, word of Perkins' encounter had spread from one end of the country to another. It was not long after my arrival that some Maori Christians asked me what I thought about his remarks. I let them know in no uncertain terms that I agreed with them. I went on to explain that I believe that the Maori culture was created by God, and that while some evil influences had permeated, as it has all cultures, God basically loved the Maori way of life and wanted to purify it and lift it up to what it was originally intended to be. I explained that the more Christianized the Maori society became, the more Maori it would be. The music, dances, and other art forms of the Maori people should not be rejected, but should be utilized as instruments for glorifying God. It's hard to describe the enthusiasm with which my Maori friends greeted my perspective on their culture, and I was soon to see its impact. Two days later, I was speaking at a youth rally on the South Island. The word had gotten down there that I viewed the Maori dancers as an instrument of Christian worship and service. In response, some of the young people planned to surprise me during my opening remarks at the rally by confronting me with a Maori dance. I got wind of all this from my Maori youth leader who explained to me that these young people would be dancing down the aisles of the church, chanting the Maori welcome. My Maori friend told me not to be shocked by it and prepared me for it by teaching me the proper Maori response to such a welcome, utilizing the dancing gestures and the language of the Maori people. The evening of the meeting, things unfolded just as it had been predicted. When I rose to speak and took my place behind the pulpit, the back doors of the sanctuary were suddenly flung open. Coming down both aisles were Maori young people dancing and chanting the Maori welcome. Shock waves went through the entire congregation. The young people danced up to the platform and surrounded me. They stuck up their tongues and made the wild gestures that go with the greeting. I just wanted to interrupt here. I'm going to show you a video that gives an example of what this looks like. Because you can, you can, you can, you will appreciate. If you're not used to this, if you've never seen it before, <laughs> it would be quite a surprise.
Let me... I'll go on. I'll pick up with the, what Tony said. As soon as they paused, I started dancing and chanting the response I had just been taught. The Maori youth went wild with joyful excitement. A barrier had been broken. A line had been crossed. Amen. So here's some next steps. How we can put into practice the truths that we see in the scriptures. And the first step is to pray. Admit any racism you may hold in your heart. Well, don't be ashamed. It's very natural to feel uncomfortable when you're with people who are different from you. But ask God to replace any fear or prejudice with love and respect for others. Second step is to listen and learn from people who have experienced racism. Feel the impact that it has upon them. The third step is to do your part, wherever you can, wherever you are, to model a godly love and respect for all people, regardless of their race or ethnic group or whatever. Today, we're going to celebrate communion. And I think this is just perfect for when we're talking about different races, different cultures around the world. because. The message of Jesus is that we are one in him. We have this common union with him. We're sisters and brothers in Christ. One bread, one body.
温挂念，默默回头。That I sent out, I said, "Don't worry if you don't have grape juice. Don't you don't need to run out the store and buy juice just especially for this." I think the reason that Jesus used grape juice with wine and bread is simply that's what they had. That's what they had for meals. It was their common thing, common food. And so we can just simply use whatever we normally eat. If you want to have your morning coffee or juice or water, whatever. You see, the important thing isn't what we eat; it's whom we eat with. We eat with one another, and with Jesus. Let's pray as we begin. Jesus, we are gathered here to worship you. And one of the ways that we worship is celebrating this this meal together with you. We thank you, Lord. You gave yourself when you were born. You you left behind the the glory of heaven, and you came to live among us. You gave yourself, and then, as you went around the country, telling people the good news about the kingdom of God, about God's love, you again you were giving yourself. And then when you healed people that were sick, or you even raised the dead, you were giving your power, giving yourself for us. When the soldiers nailed you to the cross, and you said, "Father, forgive them; they don't know what they're doing," you were giving yourself there. And ultimately, you gave your life on that cross for us. For our salvation, and we thank you, Lord. So, as we share in this meal, Lord, we thank you. May we honor you and worship you. Amen. So, Jesus, the night before he was betrayed, he took some bread. He gave thanks to his Father for it. He broke it. Gave it to his followers and said, "Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me." So let's all of us, wherever we are now, take your whatever food you've got and give thanks to God and have some of it. And after the meal, that Jesus took the cup, <clears throat> and he said, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this, all of you." So again, I invite you, all of us, wherever you are, to drink, remember Jesus, and give thanks. Let's pray once again. Jesus, you still give yourself today. Here in this meal, you are with us. You are giving us new life. 
You give us forgiveness when we sin, when we go the wrong way. You give us your Holy Spirit to actually live in us and be with us. You are here now. And you give us wisdom to know the right thing to do. And you give us courage to do it. And so, Lord, we pray that by your strength, by your help, we may live a godly life. And we, we may love and serve those around us in your name. And that we may be part of shaping the culture in our world. To be one where people are loved and respected. Amen. Well, that concludes our worship service for today. May God bless you. And through this week, may you be a blessing to others in all that you do, all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.